Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. There were times I was scared and I had reason to be scared. I had eight births and two miscarriages in like a little over nine years time. Wow. We did have two midwives. They were Amish. They weren't licensed or certified or anything. They were administrating shots, morphine. I was in labor and she said, I need us to be prepared to run to the neighbors or out to the road for a phone to call the ambulance right away because it's to tell if your wife will live or not. Wow. She said, because a lot of times the woman dies. So see, she didn't even have a phone there. The fear that went through me and I was like, okay, I have four other children that need a mother. Yeah. And I knew like how Willis would never properly care for them. And I was like, how are these boys going to survive? Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, you can subscribe, become one of our supporters, you can leave words of encouragement for our guests, which is so helpful, not only for us, our channel, but our guests and also the algorithm. So thank you so much for doing that and engaging with us. Our guest today was referred to us by Eli Yoder, which you know very well and you love him. We love him. He has a great story. We did a few episodes with him all about the Amish. So today's episode is also going to be about someone being born and raised within an Amish community, getting married, having seven children within this relationship and the trials and the struggles and even some of the good times that came with that. So thank you so much for joining us, Elizabeth Hilty. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. I appreciate it. Yeah. And hello to everyone watching. Yes, I'm so happy that you are willing to come on and share your story. So I guess what I'd like to do is start at the beginning, what your childhood was like, what your uh, your specific Amish community was like, because I, I want to put a disclaimer out here. We know that there are many different types of Amish communities. Some are more conservative, some are less strict. There's lots of different rules that kind of are interchangeable through out. So today we are specifically speaking on Elizabeth's experience within her specific community. And so I'd like to get a better understanding of the type of community that you were part of. I grew up in a Swiss Amish community in Adams County, Indiana. It has spread to Jay County, Wells County, and even into Ohio, where I grew up about nine miles from the Ohio-Indiana border. So there now are Amish people also, like in Wilshire, Ohio, not very far from there. They have spread out quite a ways. But I grew up in a very happy home, loving parents, um, was the oldest of 12 children. So at a very young age, I took on responsibilities that Many one in today's gen, many children in today's generation don't take on mm. at that at a young age. But I helped my mom with the babies she had, with cleaning, gardening, canning, cooking, baking at a very young age. But I also have the joy and privilege of helping my brothers outside. And the horses were probably my favorite, and they still are. A memory comes back to me right now. The first time my dad let me drive a team of draft horses with one of the sickle mowers to mow our hay. And then I one time he allowed me to rake the hay. And I just love that. I love sitting behind a team of horses or driving a horse. My brothers and I would fight literally argue and fight who is going to drive the horse on our way to school. And I would always tell them, 
it's me. I'm the oldest. <laughs> I know more than you do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I had an awesome relationship with my siblings. My mom and I were more like sisters than mother and daughter. And then growing up, I was not aware of the many dynamics within the Amish church. What actually happened, what all got swept un under the rug, mm. the sexual abuse, the domestic violence that many women suffered from. I was totally sheltered from all of that. Mm. And as I got older, I had questions. And even just about some of the church rules, you know, why can't we wear certain colors? Because we were only allowed to wear blues, browns, black and grays. My mom would sometimes, when we were younger, she made us yellow dresses and my brother's yellow shirts. But other than that, we can't, couldn't have um, bright colors. So I had questions, you know, why are we not allowed to do certain things? And my answer always was from everyone around me, well, it's the way it's always been, or mm -hmm. it's the way we've always done it. This is the Amish way. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I got older, I loved reading. So I searched out and I anything I could get my hands on, I read. True stories were my favorite and they still are. But playing softball, basketball, anything in that line with my brothers, I just loved it. Sledding in the wintertime, um, singing together as a family sitting on our front porch and I am very grateful to my mom and dad and I will forever be mm. for the life they gave me I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional here no that's okay and I'm really happy to have this perspective because we are going to get into some harder topics a little bit later on but to know that you had a really great childhood is amazing and I'm really happy to have this side of things because we do get a lot of comments from current Amish saying that's a total misrepresentation of the Amish community. I had a happy childhood. And I want to say to those people that I do think that that's possible. There's mm -hmm. always the possibility of of someone missing the abuse that's happening. And I'm glad that you mentioned that it was just a case where you were unaware of things happening. So maybe it's a, a blissfully unaware situation where you weren't necessarily exposed to that, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. And so I'm really happy to hear that you did have such a lovely childhood. And it sounds like maybe you can um, expand on this. Your mom may have been a little rebellious. I don't know, <laughs> making yellow dresses and shirts, knowing that was against the rules. So maybe we can talk a little bit about what were some of the other rules, just to give people who aren't familiar with the Amish an idea, maybe describe what the dresses looked like and the modesty standards for the women and for the men. We can start there. The dresses? were very plain and we had to put pleats in the skirt. We weren't allowed to wear like in Northern Indiana and even many other conservative Amish communities, they're allowed to have what they call suits, same color cape and apron as their dress. Where I grew up, you did not have that. We weren't allowed to have the same color um, cape as we had apron and dress. And even in some families, they were not allowed to have the same color apron as their dress. It had to be a different color. Mm -hmm. Could be a different shade as long as it wasn't the same shade. Interesting. Our caps, our coverings were not white. There are not very many communities that have that. And if there are some, they are branched off from the Adams County, Indiana area. But they have black coverings, and those also vary from church district to church district. The men in the church I grew up in had to have a four inch rim on their black hats, their straw hats. That was a church rule. Um, it was a form of showing your humbleness and modesty to the world. Um, beards, 
had to be shaved a certain way as well. We had to make sure that we had our hair parted right in the middle mm. as well. No styling of the hair. So our coverings were worn 24-7. Can you explain to us what the significance of the hair covering is? They go with the verse in Corinthians that says, let her hair be covered or let her be covered to pray. I'm not good with memorizing like some people are with scripture, but I do know where it is, what it's saying. And for years, I would never like not wear a covering because I thought like without a covering on my head, um, there's no way God would hear my prayers. Interesting. Fast forward into my life, I ended up suffering from severe headaches and migraines to the point I could not stand to have my hair up mm. in a bun because my head hurt that bad. And it was through that era in my life that I came to realize that, you know what? God does hear me when I pray without a covering. Yeah. But here's the other part. It also says in Corinthians, let her hair be her covering. With the Amish people, majority of them anyway, there are some there with an open mind that will search out the truth and end up knowing the truth. But it's a never-ending circle of argument. Their argument coming back with me telling them that it says, also says, let her hair be her covering, they come back with the fact that, well, what about men? Should they then, then shave their heads? Because it says to not let him be covered when he prays. Mm. So it's a no-win situation with that, if I may say that. Yeah. But it's a never-ending argument. So what I personally do when someone comes at me with that, I tell them, you know, you believe what you want to believe. Yeah. Because... You get pulled back into this dynamic of this Amish way of thinking, and it literally sets on anxiety and confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. So that should say a lot in where this is all coming from. So back to that, the day I came to realize that was just another moment of light and truth. In growing up, we would even wear our coverings. We had a separate one that was like our, our nighty, night covering that we wore to sleep only. Mm. And I, I am totally not offended. And I respect someone. If that's their convictions, that's what they want to do, then I respect that. But the dynamic I don't like to see is where they come that if you don't have one on, you have no connection with God. He's not going to hear your prayers. Yeah. That's where I think they are being judgmental because there's no person, no um, religious circle, no preacher, no bishop, no minister, no pastor, no nothing ever going to cut your connections with God. That will happen with you alone. If your connection is cut with God, it comes from yourself. And I'm sure that was really hard to get to that space. It's kind of similar with the Mormons because I grew up ex or I, not ex Mormon. I grew up Mormon and now I'm ex Mormon, but I never had to wear garments, which are a very sacred piece of clothing that you wear under all of your mm -hmm. clothes. But I know how difficult it is having spoken to people, including my mom, who has now taken off her garments. I know it was a really hard transition to finally take that piece of clothing off and she felt naked and, mm -hmm. oh no, this, you know, this is very real now. And so I can imagine it would be similar having grown up always doing something in one way and now removing that and really just acclimating to a new understanding of your own connection with the divine. Yes. It is. And, you know, the first few times that I heard of the Mormons was after I had moved away from my um, home community. And I was like, wow, 
these people are so much like the Amish. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> they have so many similarities <laughs> from age seven to age. I was 15 years old when I graduated from eighth grade. And I loved school. School was one of my favorite places. But I also loved being at home and being able to help my mom. When I was 15 years old, my mom gave birth to my second youngest sister. And I was my mom's maid. I had the privilege of doing that. And I loved it. I loved being home with my mom. At 16, I got to start going to our youth gatherings, which in our circle, in the Adams County Amish community, they call it the crowd. Now you're old enough to join the crowd or go to crowd. And then that also meant being included on weddings when they had 21st birthday surprise parties, all of that stuff. I was able to go to that. And then it also meant if your parents were okay with it, you could start dating. Mm -hmm. And what did the dating look like? I was actually scared because my dad, my dad almost planted the fear inside of me. But to me now, I'm so thankful he talked to me, but about those things, because many, many, many females never have that where their parents talk to them about what happens when a boy and a girl have sex mm. and how boys can and will take advantage of a girl. And if she gets pregnant, boys can walk away and say, hey, that's not my baby. But girls can never do that. And if that happens within the Amish, that female or girl is scarred pretty much for life wow. because they mark her as a whore. And then the other thing is they also take those two. If the boy admits or knows, people know who it was, they will take those two and make them get married, whether they love each other or not. Right. I imagine that can be a really dangerous situation when you have someone who was assaulted and then forced to marry their perpetrator. Did you ever see that happen? A few times. But what happened was the boy and girl were dating. So everybody was like, well, they were dating, so they must have loved each other. And they never took in the fact that there is abuse, there is domestic violence, there is sexual yeah. assault in dating relationships. So what happens is here are two people getting married and who ends up suffering because these people don't want to be together. The innocent children. Yeah. Grow up in an unhappy home with many times the mother and father or one or the other ending up with alcohol addiction because in Adams County, that is a huge thing where I grew up where um, they drink alcohol freely. Is it technically allowed within the community or they have to hide it? No, it's technically allowed. Mm, okay. But through the years, there have been many people that have stepped up and tried to work on that and kind of get that to an end. But there are always people that refuse to come in agreement with with in the churches to do that. But with the flip side of that, in what I see, the people that have tried to bring that to an end are using force. And we all know force does never work to try to end anything. Not when it comes to in a community where everything is controlled. Yeah. Other than that, I enjoyed going to our weddings, our youth gatherings. I love making friends. But the dating part, then at 17, I started dating um, Willis Hilty, which I ended up marrying at when I was 21 years old. I was not educated, so I didn't know what to look for in what I call red flags mm. in dating relationships. But he was a charmer. He um, would treat me like a queen. And then when I got married, um, it all changed. 
Wow. And before we get into that, I kind of want to give people an idea, and myself included, the dating parameters and what that would actually look like. So were you able to be alone together when you were dating? Did it have to be accompanied or chaperoned? Uh, Were you able to go do activities together? How did the actual dating look? For me, yes, we were allowed to be alone. We were allowed to go to and like to family events. We were allowed to go to weddings alone, go like we were allowed to do activities alone. But then it varied from family to family. Mm. In other families, it was not allowed. They had to be in a certain room where it was okay, like the doors couldn't be closed. They were very strict. And, you know, the parents thought they were doing what is best for their children. And in our community, we did have a lot of what they called shotgun weddings, which is where a boy and girl that were dating had sex and then they would have to go to church and they would get excommunicated for six weeks. And either they would be married right that day when they were taken back into the church or their wedding would be set like the next Thursday or within a week. Okay. So there was no sort of repentance process where they could continue dating before they got married. It was repent and then your consequences getting married. They were excommunicated for six weeks. And in between that time, they were not allowed to be alone. Okay at all. And then it was get married. Um, If they got married right in church services, then they would maybe a couple weeks later have like a wedding supper or reception where it was just the meal Mm. for the bride and groom. But I did have a cousin that she got married and she got married in church like that and never had a reception. And to this day, I feel sad for her because She never got to experience the joy of having a wedding meal for her and her husband. Yeah. And before we get into your marriage as well, I'd like to get a better idea as to what the sex education looked like. So I know it varies from community to community and probably family to family, as you've mentioned already. But I'm wondering, because, for example, in Eli's community, he wasn't even allowed to know what pregnancy was Mm -hmm. until he was about to get married. And you had, you were the oldest of 12 kids. So I imagine you probably had some idea of what was going on with mom, but I'd like to get a better idea of what your understanding was around procreation, around even your menstrual cycle, around how sex works, or if you only knew about everything at that, that talk with your dad at 16. Okay, first and second grade, I actually went to public school. Mm, Okay. And then my parents switched me over to an Amish school. With pregnancy, I mean, I would hear snatches from adults talking, overhearing conversations that I was not supposed to hear. And I love to sit around and listen to adults talk. I That was one of my favorite things to do. But nobody ever told me where babies come from. I remember asking my mom um, I knew I could tell she was pregnant and I was like nine or ten years old and I remember asking her you know um, about how long you know it will be until we will have a baby brother or sister whatever Mm -hmm. because see we never did ultrasounds either to where we knew what it would be Mm -hmm. and she was like who told you? Where did you get that information? And I just laughed at her and said that, Mom, I'm not dumb. (laughs) You just figured it out. (laughs) But then I overheard my mom talking to one of her sister-in-laws, my dad's brother, his wife. And I was supposed to be reading a book. And I was listening in on their conversation. And they were talking about the nine months that it takes to um, for a baby to be born, you know, the nine months of being pregnant. And my mom was like, you know, just the other day, Elizabeth had, she said something about, or was wondering how long it'll be until the baby is born. That was something that wasn't talked about. You didn't tell your children 
that you were expecting a baby. Mm. You didn't tell them how sex happened, how babies were made. And even with what my dad and mom both told me at 16, I didn't actually know what happened when someone had sex. Oh. That there wasn't really explained. I just knew there was something that went on between a boy and a girl that could make a baby. And I was like, no, I will not have a baby and no boys are touching me. Right. So you didn't even know what to avoid. You just knew to avoid men. Yes. <laughs> but if we, as a dating couple, in some families, they might have chosen to have a hands-off courtship. But if anything went on more than holding hands and kissing and you were a member of the church, you had to go to church and do a confession. In front of everybody? Yes. Did you ever have to do that? Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> oh, no. How was that? Do you mind talking about that? No, I don't. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Very embarrassing. And looking back, if I would have known back then when I was dating Willis to what I know now, he actually was being abusive sexually to me. Mm. So... In reality, I thought I had to because, okay, I was there, like, I didn't physically resist anything. So just because I didn't do anything to him, it still happened to me. So I still have to go and do a confession in church. Right. To me, it was very humiliating and shaming. And with young girls, especially, and even boys, like, these kids are not educated about sex and the hormone change that they go through. So when they reach this peak level, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so they go to wherever, to animals or whatever. Yes, the Amish do have sex with animals. Oh, wow. They do. That is something that does happen a lot. Back with the dating part, you know, they're... It varied by family, but the part that you had to either tell your dad and your dad would tell the bishop or one of the ministers, you know, hey, my boyfriend and I touched each other inappropriately. And then you went to church and you did a confession. From what I know, it's meant to be a form of accountability with trying to keep them pure. Yeah. But... It also brings on a lot of shaming. Yeah. A lot of shaming and humiliation and also guilt that does not belong to them. Mm -hmm. I was taught about Jesus. My mom and dad taught us about him. We heard about him in church, but it wasn't until I was like in my teens and a little older that I understood that going to church, doing confession about something I did wrong is actually just an outward thing. It's in your heart. You can be forgiven before you ever do that confession. I can't imagine having to go up in front of people because I had to do that behind closed doors with a bishop, which was already mm -hmm. humiliating and mortifying being alone in a room with this man. But it just adds another level of public shaming when you have to stand in front of a congregation. Did it they does. make you give details or did you just have to say, I've sinned? You had to get on your knees in front of the whole congregation. Like you went up in front of the ministers, right, sat on a bench right in front of the ministers or a chair. And then you got on your knees and you said how you are sorry that you sinned against God and the church and you will try to do better from here on. Mm. And then you got back up and then they would say, you know, now you're slate, you're, you're forgiven and we won't talk about this anymore. It's erased. God has forgiven you. In reality, God had already forgiven that person if they had repented or confessed to him in whatever they did wrong. They compare the church with Noah and the ark and what, what happens inside the church stays inside the church. You don't take it outside. Interesting. And that's what they have really come against me is because I speak out. 
and talk about the things I know that happen inside of the church. Right. Because on one hand, it could seem like a good thing if you go and you get it off your chest and then no one talks about it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when you have perpetrators going in saying they're sorry, they have their... Um, is it called the ban yes. where they're not allowed to be talked to or spoken to, they're excommunicated for however long they decide and then they reoffend, or even if they don't reoffend and the victim, the survivor, needs help, needs counseling, needs support, and they're not able to speak about that to anybody or they get in trouble for that, mm -hmm. that's where I can see it being problematic. Yes, and like that's that was my issue with all of that is because many times it wasn't just a one time thing that happened, especially with sexual abuse. Like I have a sister that was molested by my ex's brother and the horrible things she went through, like with that happening, but also in her early life, she never had that carefree childhood that I had. She was between seven and eight years old when it happened to her. And he was, he was 18 or 19 mm -hmm. years old. He was old enough that he should have been charged and criminally have a criminal record on it. Yeah. Because she wasn't his only victim. The things that I personally saw my parents experienced with her going through was horrible years after happening. My sister spoke about it to me. She was about 14 years old. And he was had moved on and had married already. But he came to my parents' house with his wife and wanted to apologize to my sister. Well, I don't know what he was thinking that my sister would even want to talk to him. He told my mom and dad that between God and I, I'm free from all of that. I've been forgiven. He said, I can move on with my life and my slate is clean. And I told my mom and my mom also agreed with me. She said, no, no, that's not right. He can't just move on with his life. He literally ru pretty much ruined young girls' lives to where they will have a lifelong battle I mean, yes, you can heal from sexual abuse, but that there is a lifelong thing that certain things come up and those memories come right back at you. Does it get better over time? Yes. Yes, it does. But doesn't mean that it's easier to deal with when those memories come back up. Mm -hmm. So with all of that, like I feel there's not enough accountability within the Amish it's forgive and forget. If you keep talking about it, then you're not forgetting. And talking about something that happened to you, especially sexual abuse or any form of abuse, is very important. And it's also important for the victim to know that the perpetrator will be held accountable. And the Amish don't do that. They sweep it under the carpet. Yeah. I think there's a few different things going on here, too, that I feel the need to address. And the first one is if you are a religious person and you do something wrong and you feel you've gotten forgiveness from God, that's also a beautiful thing. And I don't think public shaming needs to be a part of that. That's the what we spoke of previously. And then on the other hand, you have just breaking the laws of the land, right? Mm -hmm. The laws that we have put in place as a community, as humanity. And when those things are broken, what you and God speak about, your relationship with God, it's, it's a personal thing, but also there needs to be accountability when you're doing something so severe and other people are severely affected, then yes, there needs to be some sort of action taken aside from you've been forgiven. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Yeah. So let's get back to you with your story. You dated for a few years and you marry your husband. And is anything different immediately? Is there something that changes within your relationship or does the abuse become a gradual thing? Does it gradually start to occur? Actually, a couple of weeks before we got married, Willis, my ex-husband, we were driving down the road in the buggy and talking and he goes to me, I just want you to know 
that once we are married, I will do what I want and you're not going to change my mind. If I decide I don't want to do something, I'm not going to do it, no matter what you say. If I want to do it, I'm going to do it, no matter what you say. Whoa. And, you know, that alone should have been enough for me to walk away. Now, I literally would. Back then, I didn't know what I know now. Yeah. So in hindsight, I can't blame myself for that. But I got married. And the day of our marriage, of our wedding, um, is the day I realized what kind of man I actually married. Oh. He got upset and mad at my dad. And I don't know, like, all the details, what all happened or what his issue was with my dad that day. But I know I tried to tell him, you know, this is my dad's property. And I feel he deserves to be respected and abide by his wishes because he did, though, pay for the wedding. The first few months that we were married, I gained over 30 pounds. And I never should have gained that much weight in such a short time. I always say it was stress weight, and I have never been able to lose that. I have sometimes lost some of my childbirth weight, but I have never been able to lose that 30 pounds. Mm. Time went on. I was um, pregnant with my oldest son, and I started leaking um, fluid. My water broke, and the midwife made it clear that no sex, it needs to be kept clean. Mm. How early in your pregnancy do you remember? This was towards the end of my pregnancy. Okay. It was almost to my due date, and my water had just broken, but the labor stopped, so she sent me home. But she had told me, you know, the res- what I should be doing to keep it clean. Well, regardless, you know, of what the midwife said, sex still had to happen. Was that a community rule or was that something that your husband was forcing on you? That was just something that he forced on me. Because I, like, I don't know. There are probably many, many Amish women that live like that and never talk about it. I'm probably just one of the majority of women that chose to leave and speak out about it. Yeah. With Willis, he was then eventually diagnosed with narcissism and antisocial personality disorders. That there, I had no idea there was a name out there like that. There was a diagnosis out there like that. But when he was diagnosed with that and the doctor was saying, you know, all the symptoms with that, I was like, yes, I could have told you that one. I could have told you that one. I just didn't have a name for it. Mm. But he was very aggressive. And it didn't matter if I wanted sex or not. I was his wife. I was his property. I was to do whatever he said. The first two years, we lived at his parents in a, like an apartment in their shop upstairs. Many Amish homes have what they call a slop bucket. It's for their scraps. The women pour all their scraps in. And then it's the men or the young boys duty to go and dump that to the hogs or chickens or just out in the field, wherever. So I grew up in a home where we didn't have that. We dumped them as we went. My mom was like, that's filthy. I don't want one in my home. Mm-hmm. If someone else had one, we didn't have an issue with it. So Willis told me I need to have one. And I told him, I don't want one. Said, I can dump my own scraps. I don't want one standing around here. With me telling him, no, that I'm not going to have one, he literally pulled on my ears so hard that I felt something pull right in here in my ears and pop. About a week later, I got a really bad ear infection to where I couldn't hear out of that ear. Mm. And ever since then, I have had issues with my ears on that part. And I used to never, like, I could go out in the wintertime without, with just my head covering on, 
and nothing else. And I would not get ear infection or my ears wouldn't hurt or anything. After that, they would hurt so bad sometimes. Mm. They literally hurt something. But I did end up without a scrap bucket. I won on that one, even though he won my ears. <laughs> wow. Something so simple. To me, it was childish. It was childish that he reacted that way. It was inside the house. He should have left that up to me and how I wanted to do it. But everything was, however his mom did it, I was supposed to do. So he would come home from work and come inside, and I might be cleaning, baking, cooking, whatever. And he was like, that's not how my mom did it. Or that's not how you do it. My mom does it so and so. So I would tell him, you know, but this is how I do it. Well, he would go over to his parents' house and then come back and tell me, no, mom said you do it so-and-so. And finally, I got to the point where I told him, if that's what you want, then you can go, you know, have your mom do it for you. Yeah. Have your mom do it. This might sound really mean, but I remember in the later years in our marriage where I would get so upset with him and I would literally just hold everything inside until I would explode. That was not a healthy way of doing it. But I knew like if I talked, um, my voice didn't matter. And it always resulted in violence mm. or having things taken away from me, like my perfume, um, my boys' clothes. Some of their shirts would be hidden because, yes, I did make my boys yellow shirts. <laughs> 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 And he hated the color yellow. And in that church district where we lived, we were allowed to have brighter colors. We were allowed to have green after I got married. Certain shades of green. They were a little more liberal where we had um, motors on our washing machines. And we also had inside toilets. But they had to be flushed by hand with water dumping into the bowl or into the tank. Or then a hand pump hooked up to the tank where you would pump water into it. Mm. So they were a little more liberal to where the church that we moved in after I was married. But if he got mad at me, then he would take my perfume or the boy's shirts that he knew that I loved, like the colors that I loved. Um, he would take the checkbook or money and hide it until I came to realize that this was actually something he's doing to see what kind of reaction he'll get out of me to trying to punish me and make me beg. Then once I came to realize that I quit reacting, I wouldn't yeah. even ask him where they are. I wouldn't even ask him where my perfume was. But the reason he hid my perfume is because he said I would wear it to turn on other men. Oh, geez. And I was like, why would I want another man when I can't even take it what you give me? I gave birth to my oldest son, and I got pregnant right away with my second son again. Um, my second son was born March of 2009, and my youngest son, my oldest son, turned one year old two weeks later. Oh my goodness. They are always the same age for two weeks. Then in 2010, I gave birth to another son. 2011 to boy number four on our fourth anniversary. 2012, I gave birth to another boy. And that was actually, I actually had eight sons um, total. And he was four and a half months old when he died from SIDS. Mm, I'm so sorry to hear that. It threw me for another loop because I was not expecting this. And then to top it off, people would ask me, you know, why are you taking this so hard? Why is it? Why can't you get over it? You should oh. just be glad that he went to be with Jesus. And that was not the part. Um, I found him in his crib. And if you ever 
if anyone ever has come up on someone that is dead or finds a dead person, um, my heart goes out to them. And I, I literally cry for them because I know what it did to me in finding my baby all limp like a rag. Mm. And then having my four oldest sons be right there and witnessed it. It was hard going on with that about a month after Samuel died is when the whole thing was exposed with my sister and his brother of molesting my sister. And Willis felt that my parents, especially my dad, was lying because my dad called it rape, which is what it was. And him and I got into an argument about it. He told me, he said, I'm going to teach you to listen to me. Where he slammed me into the wall was an indentation in the drywall where my head hit. Mm -hmm. He threw stat iron at me, kicked me in the behind. And this was all my four and five-year-old son witnessed everything. To the point that my five-year-old son um, spoke up and said, Dad, stop it. You're being mean to our mom. To our mom, leave her alone. Then once Willis walked out of the house, my oldest son ran after him and goes, Dad, you're so mean. You're so mean. Just stay away. Mm. And years later, my oldest son did tell me that he literally blamed himself. He felt he should have been able to protect his mom. Oh, that poor little thing. That's so sweet that... He obviously loves you so much and thought that it was his job to protect you. I know, and they they still do like they protect me and if if I am gone or even when I work nights already, um they will literally call me or text me and say, Hey mom, when are you going to be home? And I'm like, Is something wrong? No, we're just checking up on you. They're concerned for my safety to the point where they still do. And I always tell them, you know, I am an adult. Mom is now like out of danger. And if I ever need anything, I will let you know. Mm. But if that makes you feel better in texting me or calling me, then do that. There's nothing wrong with that. And seeing if mom's okay. March of 2013, my baby had died from SIDS. And then in January of 2014, I gave birth to another son. April of 2015, I gave birth to another one. And in between the 2015 and the 2014 one, I had also a miscarriage. Mm. April of 2015, when... I had a baby when my second youngest son was born. After that, I told um, different people I need to go somewhere for help. I had sunk into such a deep depression. I didn't know about PTSD back then, but that's what I had been suffering from. So um, I had actually met some awesome Amish people from Topeka, Indiana. And... I had stayed in contact with them back in 2014. I had met them, stayed in contact with them. And they actually came down, the Amish couple came down, talked to Willis, to the ministers, and they got them to agree to letting me go to Rest Haven, kind of where the Amish and Mennonites stay. But then they go to Oak Lawn in Goshen, Indiana, for treatment. So... This nice couple got this bishop and ministers to agree to let me go and got Willis to agree to let me go. So I took the children to my parents and they took me home with them that night. And the next morning, they drove me out to Rest Haven where I was admitted, which I went out of my own free will because I knew I needed something to help me. I couldn't do this any longer. Yeah. And before we move on to that, I just had some questions for you. We get a lot of questions about the home birthing situation. And I'd like to know in your specific situation, if you had adequate access to health care when it comes to having your babies. I mean, having eight children, that's 
I can't even imagine. That's quite an undertaking. And if you're living in a home with no electricity and you aren't able to visit hospital, or was it the case in your community that you could go to the hospital to have your children? Some of them chose to go to the hospital, but we did have two midwives. They were Amish. Um, They weren't licensed or certified or anything, but they did it for years. Okay. But the issue I had with it was they were administrating shots, morphine, different things that only are for doctors or registered nurses to administer. And they were doing that without being licensed or certified. Um, Some of their supplies came from the vet. Some were supposedly supplied by a doctor that they chose to not give out his name once they were actually charged with administering shots, uncertified and unlicensed. But no, I wasn't allowed to go to the doctor, not because of my church or community. It was from Willis. How did you feel about all of that? Did you feel taken care of? Were you afraid? Were you comfortable? Looking back, yes, there were times I was scared and I had reason to be scared. But my mom also, with having the size family that she had and the amount of babies, um, helped me along with, you know, natural things and what I can take. But my body had, was so low at times from giving birth in such a short amount of time because I had eight births and two miscarriages in like a little over nine years time. Wow. So my body was wore out. Yeah. I was not in a very healthy situation when I gave birth to my last son. The midwife would try her best and I I liked her. But it was just the fact that it would scare me because I was like, you know, does she actually understand you know, what these drugs can do to someone, especially number six, my third youngest son. um, I was in labor and she discovered that my, the cords were coming out before the baby. Mm. And Willis wondered, you know, what that means. And she looked at him and said, well, if I can't get the cords to go back in and they come out first, it's definitely the baby will be dead. And she said, I need you to be prepared to run to the neighbors or out to the road to, for a phone to call the ambulance right away because it's to tell if your wife will live or not. Wow. She said, because a lot of times the woman dies when there's a birth like that. So see, she didn't even have a phone there. And when she said that, I still remember like the fear that went through me. And I was like, okay, I have four other children that need a mother. And I knew like how Willis would never properly care for them. And I was like, how are these boys going to survive? And yet on the other hand, I knew how he was with me. And I was like, you know, I I wouldn't care if I died. Then I just told God, I said, God, you know, I will live for my boys because I'm all they have. And if you let me live, I will keep them safe forever. I will do my best to keep them safe. And I prayed that as she was trying to get the cords to go back inside. And she goes couple minutes later, she goes, everything's okay again. Whew. So I, I feel it was God moved those cords back and answered my prayer and letting me stay to care for my boys. But I had a healthy baby boy. Oof, that situation. I, I have to say as well, and I've said it in previous episodes, that I'm not against home birth. I mm-hmm. think if 
you have a healthy pregnancy and and you feel comfortable doing that and you have access to help. It's more about the options Mm -hmm. that are provided to somebody. So if somebody wants a home birth, great. If someone wants a hospital birth, great. As long as they're being adequately supported and they have the resources and the help that they need. Mm -hmm. So I just had to put that out there. But there was also a couple of comments and I wanted to verify this with you if you're comfortable with it. Some people were saying that it was a tradition for as soon as the mother gives birth to have sex with her husband, and it just makes me want to scratch my eyes out. I just can't even put myself in that position and think what that would be like. So is that something that you had to experience? Yes, I did. Um, Maybe not right back to back, like right in the facility or like where the midwife was because she had like a birthing center, even though she wasn't licensed or registered or um, certified, she still had like rooms for the women. Mm -hmm. It didn't ever happen in there, but like I went home within a couple hours after giving birth. Mm -hmm. For me, it was not uncommon. Like within two weeks, sex was happening if I wanted it or not. And which obviously, I don't know why I would have even wanted it. My body was not in shape for it. Right. And I do know of other women where they literally experienced it right after the baby was born. I just am trying to understand why that would be the case. If Is it a religious thing? Is it just something that the man claiming his wife again? I'm, I just don't. I can't comprehend it. The women are the men's property. They're their property. They're not. Now, there are some good Amish men that will not do that to their wives. They love them. They cherish them just like Jesus tells them to. But then we have these other men that, no, you're just a piece of property. And that's what I was. Mm. I was just an object. My dad would tell me, if he wants to treat you, that if Willis wants to treat you this way, why didn't he just marry a cow? Wow. So that was my dad's response because I know he never did that to my mom. Did they have their share of problems Um, disagreements of course they did every relationship has it but my dad would have never hurt my mom like that so I'd like to hear a little bit more about your time in the mental health facility before you eventually escaped the Amish community and everything that ensued with that my time spent at Rest Haven um, and Oak Lawn with professional counselors professional therapists and doctors Um, was very beneficial to me. I received a lot of healing through that and forever thankful for those people. I went back home a stronger person. Willis was diagnosed through that with antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders, as I had mentioned previously. I was diagnosed with severe major depressive disorder, PTSD, and high anxiety. And I remember the doctor asking me what I'm going to do about this. And I told him, get better. And he said, good, because I don't want you to play the blame game. Even though this was brought on by Willis, the things he did, he said, but if you choose to not say, hey, this is your fault, and take it on yourself to find ways to heal, he said, you will get through all of this. But they very much told the ministers, the bishops, um, both set of parents, that the violence needs to stop because that needed to stop. It was um, sexual violence. It was um, physical violence to the point where in the sexual part, he would hold his hand over my mouth Mm -hmm. when I would be screaming for pain. (sighs) And I would tell him to stop and he wouldn't. But then moving on to, I got back home, Willis got home, and his first concern right away was that I got, that I get pregnant. Jeez. So I got pregnant, and I didn't tell him until I was about three or four months pregnant. Because every time I got pregnant, it was like he took advantage of it. He knew I didn't feel good, and I didn't have it in me to stand up for myself. 
Um, so he knew he could literally take advantage of me. Things kept getting worse instead of better, but yet he kept telling the ministers that it's getting better, that everything's going well. So in September of 2016, um, he came home from a school event with a PTA meeting, and I hadn't gone. I had been to Fort Wayne to see my counselor. And I came home, and he came home, and he was mad because I wasn't home earlier. And he started going into a rage. And I was actually in bed already. The boys were sleeping, and I was scared. I ran out of the house, ran across the road to my non-Amish neighbors, called a friend. She was actually a victim advocate from LaGrange County. I called her. And she ended up calling the police for me. Um, two sheriffs came out, talked to both of us. And the one sheriff, before he left, he told me, he said, we want you to know that we are here. You call us if you need us. Wow. That's what we're here for. So, but through that, the next night, the minister, one of the ministers and the bishop came over. And they wanted me to do a confession in church because the police had been there. It was my fault as well, as much as Willis's fault. A confession being done happened multiple times throughout the marriage where I had to confess with him in front of church that I was as much in the wrong as he was because it takes two to fight. Oh, that's not okay. I see, you know, I won't get anywhere with them. So I just did a confession, decided, okay, I have other options. I knew, you know, I could leave. I had the help of these people from uh, Topeka, Indiana, Northern Indiana, Amish community that were, would help me. So I knew I could. My only thing was financial support. I, I didn't have any money. I didn't know how I would ever support my seven children, which six children at that time, and I was mm -hmm. pregnant. So I started making preparations after that September and leaving. I called the women's shelter, Adams Wells Crisis Center. I called them and I started making preparations. And then it came up close to Christmas and I was like, why do I have to leave? And I know I'm going to miss out on all of our family gatherings over Christmas. That's not fair. My boys won't get to experience one more Christmas with everyone. So I stayed and made preparations that the next time an episode happens of abuse, that I could call the Adams Wells Crisis Center and leave. Early January of 2017, um, I was eight and a half months pregnant and I called Adams Wells Crisis Center and they told me, they had told me prior to that that they could call the police for me and have them come check check up on me. Well, when I called them that day, they told me, we can't do that. The police need to hear from you, mm. the sheriff's department. So I went over January 11th, 2017, early in the morning after my ex-husband Willis left for work, and I called the sheriff's department. I didn't even dial 911. I just dialed the sheriff's department number. And they got me on the line with the sergeant and the sergeant had one of his guys come out to my house until he got there. Once the sergeant got there, he took me to his car and he said, you know, before we can take you, we need to have a report written up in why we're taking you away. He let me talk and kept writing. I don't know that he said more than a dozen words while I sat there in his car. But after I was done talking, he just sat there and looked at me and didn't say anything. And I was like, yeah, it's probably another one just like these Amish bishops. He's going to tell me I'm crazy. And I just need to be more a more submissive wife, listen to the church and do everything that they tell me to. And he did not. He asked me if I know what this is called, what I just described to him. And I told him, no. And he said, it's rape. And that was mind blowing to me because I had never before in my life 
been told that rape can happen in a marriage. So with him telling me that, I asked him, I said, so what, what time will you be back to pick me and my boys up? And he looks at me and he said, you're going inside now. We're not leaving without you. It's not safe. Yeah. This is too dangerous. So they took me and my boys to the women's shelter. I was taken to a sexual assault center in Fort Wayne where they did DNA testing so they could take that to the judge. Not quite two weeks after I left, I gave birth to my youngest son. Wow. Willis was not present for that. I requested that he's not there, and there was also a no-contact order. He was then, in June of 2017, sent to prison for a level three felony charged with rape. And the judge threw in a no-contact order because the Amish had packed that courtroom so he threw it in for the safety of me and the children because they were all there to support him. <sighs> there might have been two or three Amish ladies that came to support me. But other than that, they were all there for him. Um, if anybody is ever interested in it, uh, my victim impact statement is public in the Adams County Courthouse in Indiana. So anybody can go in and get a copy if they ever want one. I am open. I knew that it would be out there for the public at that time, and I didn't care. So I just want to clarify quickly. First of all, you have just given birth, and now you have to go through this trial. You have seven children to take care of, and it's so much. That's so much that you had to go through, and I am... I'm so sorry that you had to face that. And also, I'm in awe of how brave and courageous and how you were able to persevere through that because that's just so much to take on in one time. And also, the Amish are not supporting you. They're supporting the perpetrator, mm -hmm. which is mind-blowing to me. I, I just don't understand why that culture exists. And I've heard it with other stories as well. So I know this is not an isolated incident. Mm -mm. And you must have just been feeling so betrayed by your own community. And you moved into another community after. And at what point did you realize, I, I can't do any of this anymore? Because you only left in 2022, right? Yes, I did. When I left Adams County in 2017, then the church, this, the church in, and the Amish people in Adams County shunned me. And they also harassed some of my family really bad to the point that my parents moved out of the community for a couple months. Mm. But through all of that, um, they shunned me. And here's the part that sometimes blows my mind as well is the only part they ever excommunicated my ex-husband Willis was for five weeks. For five weeks, he was never shunned more than that. So I was shunned, and the only way they would remove that shunning is if I promised that I would take Willis back and live with him, reconcile with him, and that I would get the state to lift the no contact order. And I refused to do that. Yeah. Because I said, if one of my boys gets hurt, or something happens to any of them because he was abusive to the kids as well. Oh. If any of them get hurt, it's going to be on me. And I'm not doing that. So I was shunned for from 2017 up until 2021. In June, I was in a different church district. I had lived in a couple different church districts in northern Indiana. And by the way, there are awesome people, Amish people in that community that I love, but they were manipulated by the Burn Amish community. So up until June of 2021, the church district I lived in at that time then in Shipshawana, that bishop went and lifted the shunning off of me where I wasn't shunned anymore in that community. In that in the northern Indiana community. I wasn't shunned anymore, but I was still shunned back in Adams County. Wait, so you moved into a new place and you were shunned as if you were still in the old place? Yes. 
How okay? It follows you. It doesn't matter where you go. If you were shunned in one community, it follows you wherever you go. How did you survive with Jesus? How did you survive, Elizabeth? You have seven children, because Jesus is the only one. I'd like people to understand, and you should be the one to explain it as far as what that entails when you are shunned, because it's my understanding that no one can speak to you and you're basically alone, like you're cut off from everybody. And how are you, how are you working to feed your children, to feed yourself, to run a household on your own. The shunning is where I couldn't sit at the same table as my parents. They can't take um, anything from me. I, I cannot give Christmas gifts. I cannot give any, make any food that I make. They cannot eat it. If I help prepare any food, um, people are not, Amish people aren't allowed to eat it. That was in my home community, and shunning varies from this, like from community to community. So the one here in northern Indiana, um, I wasn't allowed to make food and stuff or help like prepare it, but I could sit at the same table, but then I couldn't take out of the same bowl, the same pot. Like someone would literally fix my plate like I was a child. And you dealt with this for three years? four years. And here is what really got me was even my boys, like, you know how children are, they want their mom to get them food or fix their plate. I couldn't even do that. How were you expected to provide for them at home? People at that, like at church and um, social gatherings and all of that, people would fix my boys plates for them. But then at home, like, when my boys and I were alone, we were fine. Okay. Like, I could do all of that. But it was just when in gatherings and in church. But the way I provided for them was the Amish in northern Indiana went and um, set up a benefit fund for me where they donated money so I could stay home and didn't have to work. And I love that. I will forever ever be thankful that God put it in their hearts to help me like that. And I love these, love those people. Um, it is not their fault in what happened. And I hope that they can hear me at some point say that they listen to one of the podcasts that I'm on, on here or one of the others that they know that I love them. And even my family, all of them, I do. But it is not these people in northern Indiana. It's not their fault. Yeah. So I wasn't allowed to make any decisions. I was supposed to have the ministers or some some form of approval from the Amish. So that's where I was thrown into because they were trying to work with the Adams County Amish people in reconciling Willis and I. And I tried to tell them my concerns about this and how my children feel about it, that they don't want that to happen. But I was told, like, well, you know, you need to give them a fair chance. We all believe in a person can change. And so I, by that point in time, I was tired of it. I was like, I'm not going through all of this again with these Amish people and trying to stand up for myself. I had outside people that were there for me and I knew it would be very tough to leave because I would lose my family to the point where um, they would literally shun me where I couldn't attend any family gatherings. Up until that point, I could go to family gatherings and participate in a lot of things, but they still shunned me to a certain point. But I knew when I leave the Amish, it will be severely imposed on me. So I just told God, I said, if that is what you want for me to leave, I will. But you need to place the people in my path and let things happen to know that this is what you want. And he did. 
things kept happening and they kept the Amish people kept pushing about reconciling with Willis and I was like I can't do this I can't mm -hmm. so the bishop came over to talk with me about some things and he wondered you know wanted to know why I have done this or I have done that and I told him well you know what I'm not coming back to the church anymore so you decided to leave and you didn't want anything to do with it anymore, or at least you couldn't take it anymore. Maybe you still wanted to keep some of the values and traditions that you learned and you somehow escaped with your seven children. Yes. And here's the thing, you know, at first I said I left the Amish, but I have gotten to the point where I can say now I did not leave them. I escaped a cult. Mm. Because if you go through the definition of a cult, that's exactly what they have. So I left at 36 years old um, with all seven of my children. I, a year ago, I sold my house in LaGrange, Shipshawana area, and bought a house in Milford, Indiana, and have now lived there for almost a year with my seven sons. Um, I bought my first vehicle in June of 2022, got my first ever driver's license in July of 2022. Prior to all of that, I had never driven a vehicle. I had never been behind the wheel. All the things like that I had to personally look after that were actually taking care of me within the Amish community was hard because it would have been easy to just stay there. But then with all of that, I also knew what all I would go through. And in order for me to gain my freedom and getting away and escaping, I had to make a lot of sacrifices. But it's been worth it. But I still value, love going to church, um, value my relationship with God and Jesus. And the awesome part about it is my second youngest son has over the, this past summer, they joined the youth high five camp, got his spiritual birth certificate where he gave his life to Jesus. And that made me proud because my boys have an understanding of the relationship with Jesus that I didn't even have at that age. I didn't have that. I mean, yes, I was taught no offense to my parents, to anyone. But they have an understanding of a lot of things. They are so wise beyond their years. So I filed for legal separation while I was Amish, switched over to a divorce a little over a year ago. And finally... Um, August 21st, it was finalized of this year, 2023. <gasps> wow. I'm just so happy for you, Elizabeth. Honestly, it's just, it's so amazing everything that you've been able to accomplish. And you're clearly an incredible mother and your sons are so lucky to have you. And I'm sure even just the day to day is probably so much easier with all of the modern day conveniences. Do you have a favorite modern day convenience out of everything? <laughs> I don't know which one to choose. <laughs> As a mother of seven. <laughs> I love my dishwasher. Yes, dishwasher. I love my washer and dryer in my basement right in my home. Yes. Um, I love my electricity. Yeah. That's probably my favorite one is the electric where I never have to start a generator. Um, I don't do laundry by hand the way I grew up doing it. And see, my boys, re my older boys remember in having to carry in wood for our wood stove. They would do a lot of things like that. And I've told them already, you know what? You guys are spoiled. And my <laughs> oldest son looks at me and goes, Mom, no, we are not. We just really appreciate and are thankful for what oh, we have now. <laughs> that's so sweet. And that really like made me think my mother heart was proud of him. Yeah. That 
they actually think that way. They're not taking advantage of it, but they're thankful for what they have. Also, I got our first TV mm -hmm. where we could actually watch movies, which we could do that with our phones before, but there's just something different about and watching it on a TV. Yeah. Which I rarely have time for that, but my boys have more time than I do. Um, I love my my home just overall with all the modern conveniences that I never experienced before. Yeah. It's just awesome. But then in March of 2023 this year, I had an accident. And my dream vehicle had always been a Suburban or a Yukon. Mm -hmm. So with my accident, um, my 2010 Honda Odyssey was totaled. So I got a 2018 Yukon. You got your dream car. And I actually didn't get my dream. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> And I do, for people that are wondering, I've had people ask me, how do you pay for, how can you afford a vehicle and a house with seven children? I do, I work full time, have a job, and I do now receive child support as well. Mm -hmm. And my ex-husband was also ordered by the court to pay back child support from the day of filing from for the legal separation was May 18th, 2022. And from May 2022 to December 2022, he didn't pay a penny. And he had not paid prior to that either, but I just couldn't go back further legally because of not having anything filed. Yeah. So he's ordered to pay all of that back child support, the rear each. Wow. As well, which comes up to a nice amount. What a success story. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all of that and being open and willing. And before we go, I need your Linda Listen moment, either a sassy statement or some inspiration for our viewers. My inspiration to you guys is no matter how hard life gets, never give up. And if you're a believer in Jesus, Know that when Moses came to the Red Sea, Egyptians started panicking and complaining and saying that there's no way out. How are we ever going to get across? God made a way by parting those Red Sea waters. And that's exactly what he has done for me many, many times. And he will do it for you. That's beautiful. I'm so happy that you have found your consciousness, your peace what makes you feel happy and whole and free and that your sons also have the freedom that you never had before at their age. So I just think it's amazing everything that you've done. And again, thank you so much for sharing. Do you have any final thoughts before we go? Yes. There's one question that probably will come up is because a lot of people ask this, if my sons see their father. They have their first supervised therapeutic visitation coming up October 3rd. So keep them in their thoughts and prayers mm -hmm. because they are very, they are struggling. My youngest son has never met his father. My other six sons have not seen him for almost seven years. They do not want to see him, but it's court ordered where they have to at least get into the building. I have to get them at least into the building. So pray for them that God will protect them, give them the strength and wisdom yeah. to know what to do in their situation. And most of all, give them peace. Yeah. And I appreciate you having me on here. It was nice meeting you. It was so nice meeting you as well. And we're sending our love to you and your wonderful boys. And guys, if you're watching, you can leave some words of encouragement for Elizabeth and her family in the comments if you feel so called. If you would like to support the podcast even more, we have our new merch line. It's brand new. It just came out not even a week ago. We have some t-shirts with some sayings like break the silence, break the cycle. Linda, listen. I'm sorry for what I said when I was in a cult. <laughs> Lots of fun. <laughs> 
fun <laughs> stuff over there. You can find it at cultsdeconsciousness.com under the merch tab. We have lots of stuff. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that as well. Our brand new patrons, Peter and Diane, thank you so much for your support. You can find that at patreon.com slash cultsdeconsciousness. And if you like this video, guys, I'll put two more here that you're going to want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well.